All right, brave and wonderful Hurley Burleyites, it's time for the only political podcast willing to name check Cole Caulfield on a weekly basis from now until June. Because let's face it, on this Habs team, he's the glimmer. And what do you do with the glimmer? You desperately hold on to the glimmer. You karmically nurture the glimmer. You goddamn pray with every ounce of your soul that life works out well, and you see more of the glimmer. It's a two-part pod on the Hurley Burley today. Part one, we have John Boyko. John is an educator, guitar player, former municipal politician, and the noted author of eight books. His latest is The Devil's Trick, How Canada Fought the Vietnam War. It's chock full of bits that nobody knows. We're going to talk about the Canada-U.S. relationship in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the surprising ways in which Canada was involved in a war most think we had little to do with, and how Pearson, Paul Martin Sr., and Trudeau were deeply involved in that file. Part two of the pod is your weekly dose of issues analysis and a unique brand of blaspheming that could only come from the back room. It's our political panel with Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. This week, we're going to talk about Annamy Paul and the escalating tensions within her own Green Party. We'll do a one year from the Ontario election roundup. Can Doug Ford retrieve what seems irretrievable? What should Del Duke and Horvath be doing in the next 12 months? We may talk about the NACI's latest thoughts on vaccination, and we'll stick around and we'll stick around for our Hey Use this week, which we'll throw out into the void. John Boyko. I want to welcome you to the Hurley Burley. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's appreciated. How are you and where are you? Well, I am great. I am a Habs fan looking for another 1993 sitting in Lakefield just north of Peterborough, Ontario. (laughs) Great. And other than watching the Habs, what are you doing for punishment slash enjoyment? Well, because all of the schools are closed down and I have a six-year-old granddaughter, I am homeschooling so that my daughter can continue to work from home. And that is a trick. Uh, Homeschooling a six-year-old is is an interesting challenge, but we're having a great time doing it. Right. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's nice that that worked. That's nice that that worked out for your family. It is. Yeah. Um, So this book, here it is, folks. The Devil's Trick, How Canada Fought the Vietnam War. Interesting as hell and a great read because you've structured it in a really interesting way. You've basically pulled out six individuals who exemplify the various different ways in which Canada was involved in the war and uh, and told the story through sort of their eyes and then augmented around them with all the context that was going on. Really makes it easy to read and enjoyable to read and pick up the information. So thanks for doing it. What prompted you to write this book? Well, my my previous book was called Cold Fire, and it was about Kennedy's role in uh, Canadian politics, looking at Kennedy and Diefenbaker and, uh, and Pearson. And in my research, I went to the archives in Ottawa for the Pearson papers and out to Saskatoon. I went to Saskatoon in November. I suffered for my writing. <laughs> and I went to the Boston uh, in, in uh, the Kennedy papers down there. And what I discovered is so many of their conversations had to do with Vietnam. And that kind of surprised me. I thought, why are they talking about Vietnam so much? And so that led me to investigate more about Canada's role in Vietnam. And I surprised myself with what I thought I knew and didn't really understand. And that led me to this book. So it's told through six very distinct chapters that are largely unrelated to each other. Is there an overall idea or takeaway you want people to have from the entirety of the book? Yeah, I think what I'd like people to know is what surprised me most, and that is that Canada was intricately involved in the Vietnam War, in that we had diplomats there 10 years before the onslaught of the American troops in the mid-60s. We had diplomats there. We had diplomats who tried and could have, if they were listened to, ended the war before it escalated into the quagmire that it became. We had hospitals there built and run by Canadians. And at the same time, we were selling to the Americans the weapons, ammunition, TNT, vehicles, including Napalm and Agent Orange, that were helping to fill those hospitals. And so there was the hypocrisy and contradiction. I knew about the draft dodgers that came north, 
What I didn't know is how many Canadians were against those draft dodgers coming. I thought we were so magnanimous and, and welcoming them, and we were, but my God, the vast majority of Canadians did not want them and fought against them being here. So the number of, of Canadians that went to Vietnam surprised me, and the reaction that Canadians had to the, we called them boat people at the time, the refugees coming from Vietnam, the anti-boat people uh, reaction surprised me. So I guess what I'm saying is we were far more involved in far more intricate ways than I ever imagined. And that's what I would want people to take away is that what is going on, I would say today as much as then, is not what appears to be going on. So take away, I always ask the next question. Interesting. Okay, so uh, this is a political show. So I was most interested um, in exploring some of the political implications from the book. Mm -hmm. and, and let's start with this. The story seems to me to be one of the Canadian government, try, successive Canadian governments, trying to balance their opposition to the war with what they considered to be their responsibilities to their friend and ally, the United States. How do you think they walked that balance? It's a very tough balance, especially when, as the war progressed, both in the United States and Canada, more and more people were fighting against, protesting against the war. And here it was, at that point, Pearson, although it was St. Laurent that really got Canada involved, so we have to go way back. But it was Pearson and Trudeau that had to deal with the war when so many Canadians were fighting and protesting against the war. So how do you continue to make money from the war by selling billions and millions of dollars that would have uh, the equivalent of about $2 billion a year in, in today's dollars? So how do you justify making the money creating the jobs at the same time from the event that so many Canadians are against. And that balance is tough to walk. At the same time, the Americans want you to be supporting them, and you are, but you quietly are trying to tell the Americans, we don't think what you are doing and the way you are doing it is proper. And there was a couple of prime ministers, especially Pearson, who got in great trouble any time he went over the line of the quiet diplomacy and actually said what he thought. So those were the two, the political and, and the economic were, were delicate balances that the success of Canadian governments had to walk, some successfully, some not. Do you have a sense of how much of their motivation was economic, i.e. the arms sales? and how much of it was political, i.e. preserving the relationship with the United States? I think it was both at the same time. And uh, that's what I mean by asking the next question, as I know you do in your podcasts, um, is that what appeared to be the case wasn't. With respect to walking the line, with respect to the treaty arrangements that we had with the United States and the fact that we were fighting the Cold War together, and after all, this was a manifestation of the Cold War. We were directly fighting communists. And that, we had been told for a generation, was not only a good thing, but an essential thing to save ourselves. So that was underlying all of this. And when, let's take Pearson, for example, he went to Temple University in Philadelphia. And he made a, he was getting a global peace award. And so he was in his acceptance speech. He praised the Americans effusively for what they were doing in standing up to communism. But then he said, but I believe that bombing civilians in the cities and in the ports is not a great strategy for winning this war. Exactly. So when he left the stage, there was a phone call ready for him. And the next day he was at Camp David. He was at lunch with, with Johnson, who ignored him throughout the lunch as he was on the phone raving at Robert McNamara about the war and then took Pearson out to a patio outside, looked at him, 
and started to scream at him, did the full Lyndon Johnson nose to nose with him, grabbed him by the lapels, lifted the prime minister up and said, you came to my living room and you pissed on my rug. Now, how is that for a moment in Canadian-American relations? And that... I love Lyndon Johnson. Oh, (laughs) Lyndon Johnson going the full Johnson nose to nose. You can just imagine. But the trick is, and why I bring up the politics of it is, so how angry was Johnson to do that? But at the same point that Pearson was so frustrating him, he signed the auto pact with him, one of the biggest uh, economic deals in Canadian American history, especially for central Canada and a number of other uh, negotiations went forward, which means that you can be angry with the Canadians and with the Canadian leader for this particular issue, but all the other issues can go forward. And so I think that is the complexity of, of the American Canadian American relations at that time, both economic, political, military. I think in that story, you have the complexity. Did watching them walk that tightrope give you any insight at all into the conflicting pressures that Justin Trudeau would have felt trying to deal with Donald Trump for four years? Well, Donald Trump didn't try to pick him up by the lapels. <laughs> he did try to <laughs> shake his hand off at one point. Well, I think... It, uh, sorry, what, it's that notion of not saying what you really believe because no, you No, I understand. Can't. Yeah, I understand. Right. And I think what we have is the Canadian notion of quiet diplomacy, where it is much better, much more productive to work behind the scenes, work quietly behind the scenes in order to get stuff done, rather than, as Donald Trump did on Twitter and other, just shout out and say the first thing that came to mind, no matter how ludicrous it was. Trudeau understood and continues to understand that that type of back and forth is not going to win any points with anyone. So maybe some Canadians would have been very happy had he stood up publicly to Donald Trump and said what he no doubt thinks about Donald Trump. But his dad never stood up publicly and said what he thought of Richard Nixon which was not much. There is nothing to be gained in, in, I don't think, any diplomacy, but certainly not in the asymmetrical power situation that exists between us and the United States to be insulting them, even if you are being honest in what you think. And so, therefore, the quiet diplomacy, there's much to be said about that, but there's a danger, and that is that, and I think Justin Trudeau is wearing it like Pierre Trudeau did, like Pearson did, I think, in that many Canadians will then believe that you are not standing up for what they believe in quietly behind the scenes. So there is the tightrope. How does a prime minister indicate to the Canadian people, I hear you, I understand you, I'm fighting your battle, I just can't talk about it. And that is something that every Canadian prime minister from McDonald to Justin Trudeau has had to, had to balance. Right. Pierre Trudeau may have kept his tongue about Nixon most of the time, but you do quote him with one of my favorite lines. It's such a great Pierre Trudeau-esque comeback when the Nixon tapes revealed that uh, Nixon had called Trudeau an asshole and the media asked Trudeau about it. And he says, phlegmatically shrugging his shoulders, I've been called worse things by better people. Exactly. It's a great and that's, a, that's about as, <laughs> that's as close as he's going to get. But at that point, it's all over. Nixon can't hurt him anymore. Yeah, exactly. But the closest he came, I think, while Nixon was in office is when he was doing his peace tour. And, and he was being uh, criticized in Washington. He said, I'm not going to take directions from pipsqueaks from the Pentagon. And yeah. another, great. You can almost picture the shrug at the moment. But... Yeah. But that kind of direct insulting behavior, I think we learned from Trump, it it doesn't work. And it certainly doesn't work when you're on our side of the power balance. Certainly didn't bring Reagan to the table for nuclear disarmament. No. Uh, (laughs) So soft power, middle power, these are the Canadian myths that we've told ourselves over the years that we're not a superpower, but that we're not insignificant and that we play some brokerage role between the United States and the rest of the world. And we place, we have some great respect around the world that we're able to 
play, a mediation, and it's all it's all encapsulated in um, in Pearson. It's all mm-hmm. fundamentally the story of Lester Pearson is the story we tell ourselves about Canada as a middle power, as near as I can tell. Now, in your examination of this period, as Louis Saint Laurent, Lester Pearson, Paul Martin Sr. tried to apply soft power. Did they achieve anything? Did they, as they did a lot of U.S. dirty work in order to solidify that standing, did they actually affect the conduct of the war in any material respect? I would argue no. I would argue no. We were called in in 1954 when the big powers got together, when the French were finally leaving Vietnam and put together the International Control Commission. And Poland was going to represent the communist world and and India was going to represent the non-aligned and we would represent the West. Canada would represent the West. In we went as part of the International Control Commission with a very respected person leading it. Sherwood Lett was a brigadier general. He was First World War, Second World War veteran. Uh, He was an esteemed lawyer from Vancouver. He had the chops to pull it off. And Comes off like a hero in your book. Well, he was in many ways, but when he got there, he realized that despite the fact that the great powers that put him and and the other two countries in, they were going to ignore him. They were going to ignore almost everything that the International Control Commission was there to do. And when, again, we talked about Blair Seaborn a little bit, Blair Seaborn was a diplomat in 1964 that was sent by Johnson to try to negotiate with the North Vietnamese. He did, he sat down five times with the North Vietnamese in Hanoi, came back and wrote reports and said, if you do this, basically follow these, this deal, we can avoid the Vietnam War before it even begins. And Johnson completely ignored him. So the Canadians were there trying to... uh, use the soft power that you were mentioning, believing that we were still in that golden age, it was called, where we could punch above our weight. And here was Pearson first as uh, external affairs minister with the ICC in the early days, and then as prime minister, sending Blair Seaborn, and then finding out that no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how adroitly applied was this soft power, the Americans were simply going to ignore us. And a phrase that that I wrote in the book is that at the end of it all, when we did everything we could to try to mitigate what the Americans were doing there, to try to stop the bombing, to try to stop their use of Agent Orange, all of the rest of it, we were big enough that we could be independent and we could say what we thought, but we were small enough to be ignored. And I think, if anything, what the Vietnam War demonstrated is that golden age where we said the Pearsonian age where we were punching above our weight was 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 over because yeah we were big enough to be independent but we were going to be ignored because we simply did not have the power economic military power that we needed to be listened to so the golden age was over i've talked about this before farming's in my dna i was born and raised in a farming village in Saskatchewan. The industry is also in Canada's DNA. 2.3 million of us rely on agriculture for employment. It contributes $110 billion annually to our GDP. We help feed billions around the world. So we need to do more than just keep up with technology that makes farming better and more efficient. Canada needs to lead. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is doing exactly that, with TELUS Agriculture and the power of 5G. They're driving a more digitally connected and collaborative industry from seed to farm to fork. And they're doing it with innovative partnerships like the Smart Farm at Olds College in Alberta. The Smart Farm is 2,800 acres of large scale lab powered by the TELUS network. Farming practices there include using artificial intelligence to identify animals from the ground or air to detect injuries and illness. Measuring the protein content of grain, seeds, and crops in near real time through connected technologies. And tracking the precise state of the soil, air moisture levels, and current weather conditions across multiple fields from one place through connected field sensors. Let's face it, 
Given the global population, the world, ergo Canada, needs to produce more food more efficiently with less greenhouse gas emissions. TELUS Agriculture Technology helps make that possible. And it only gets better as the 5G spectrum continues to evolve. 5G means signals travel further and faster. Rural and remote connectivity explodes. The entire agriculture industry and what it means to this country is set up for the most meaningful thing possible, sustainable growth. You can learn more about all of it at telus.com slash 5G. Blair Seaborn's a good story. Blair Seaborn's a good story, and I didn't know it until I read your book. So here's let me reiterate the story. You tell me if I've got it wrong. Okay. The story is that the U.S. wants to get a message to Ho Chi Minh, and they come to the Canadian government and they say, we think you can get in to see the North Vietnamese, and we'd like you to act as our intermediary with the North Vietnamese. And the Canadians go, great, this sounds really interesting. What are the terms we're going to be offering? What are the things you're prepared to give on and you want them to give on, and how are we going to find a deal here? And the Americans go, no, no, I want you to go tell them that we want them to quit or we're going to bomb them back to the Stone Age. Yeah. Okay. And Canada goes, oh, okay. And we go deliver that message. And we go deliver it until they stop meeting with us. Yeah, Have I got that right? Yeah, that, that's the story. Uh, and what Blair Seaborn tried to, to tell the Americans, because they had no embassy in North Vietnam, they had no back channel, they had no way of speaking to Ho Chi Minh. And the reason that Johnson wanted them to go is that going all the way back to Truman, Eisenhower, they believed in the domino theory, where we have to save Vietnam from falling to communism or else the entire area will fall to communism. And Johnson, to his credit, when he took office and, and saw the mess that Vietnam was, the mess that Kennedy wanted to get out of, asked the CIA, could you do a study and take a look? Is this real? Is the domino theory legitimate? And the CIA came back in 1964 and said, no, it's not. Vietnam could fall and nothing else will happen, so pull out. And so that's why he sent Seaborn there to say, well, guys, we will leave, but you have to leave South Vietnam standing. And that was essentially the deal. And if you don't leave South Vietnam standing, then, as you say, we're going to bomb you. We're going to... And what the North Vietnam leader said is, go ahead and try. So it was like two schoolboy bullies standing up against each other because the North Vietnamese leader said, you can bomb us, you can attack us, you can send everything you've got, and we will never, ever quit. So therefore, give us a unified Vietnam, get all the foreigners out, Americans, and let Ho Chi Minh rule a unified country. And what is the shame is that when Nixon signed his deal in 1973, wasn't it exactly the same deal, a couple of details different, but exactly the same deal as Seaborn offered in 1964? But when I spoke with Blair Seaborn, a few I asked hundred him, thousand lives before. Yeah, two hundred thousand and, and, and yeah. two to three million Vietnamese killed, and and all the ramifications that happened after the war. And when I asked Blair Seaborn about that, when I met him in Ottawa, I said it must have frustrated the hell out of you. And he said, as a diplomat, I could never show that frustration, but yes. And I said, why do you think the Americans did not listen to you? And in his words, he said, they were all John Wayne. They all thought that they could be as tough as they needed to be, and they could bully the Viet North Vietnamese into agreeing. And he said, I tried to convince them that you can never win. And they didn't. It happened exactly the way they, they said in 1964. And that's the tragedy of the thing. So, you know, this fight against communism, this domino theory, this fight against communism, I've got mm -hmm. a funny, uh, <laughs> funny little side story, which is Paul Martin Jr. told me that when he was prime minister and he met with his counterpart from Vietnam, his counterpart from Vietnam said to me, explain your health care system. How does it work? And so Paul explained how Medicare works in Canada. And the Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnamese president said, well, you give it away for free? You can't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a lot of Republicans in the United States would say, too. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> you can make money from this. Why would you give it away? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, now, listen, Lester Pearson um, and to a lesser extent, Paul Martin Sr. are giants of that era of Canadian politics. Yes. And are giants of the foreign policy establishment of that era. How do you think they acquitted themselves through this period? What was your impression? Did your impression of them change due to the research you did for this book? My impression of them changed a little because I held both on such a pedestal. And it's when I read more about the fact that there were cabinet meetings in 1964 and 65 in which Martin said, because he'd been told by Blair Seaborn and, and those who followed, that we will never win. This will end badly. We know it will. We can never win this. But look at the money we can make by selling all of these military things to the American government. So let's do this. Let's continue to do this. There was a woman named, uh, uh, that was uh, Claire Colhane, and she was a protester who was protesting against the war. And one of the stunts that she pulled, she had a really well-organized campaign, but a stunt that she did was a 10-day fast. And in the 10-day fast that she held on Parliament Hill grounds, uh, Jean Marchand came out powerful minister came out and asked her, uh, what are you doing here? And they went into a debate about getting rid of all of the military industrial complex, if you will, getting rid of all of the supplies that we were sending over there. And he got angry with her and yelled at her and said, would you like to tell the 100,000 Canadians that they are going to lose their jobs because we are not supporting the Americans in this war again? And that's what it came down to. And what Pearson did is said, yes, I'll take the jobs, even though I'm supporting an immoral war that I know we can't win. And, and Martin did the same thing. In cabinet meetings, they knew what they were doing. And that I don't say it has upset me, but I would say it disappointed me. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, this uh, Culhane woman that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, read a story in the old Weekend magazine that used to accompany the Weekend Southern Papers, Canada. Yeah. And uh, read a story about this uh, great uh, t uh, tuberculosis field hospital that Canada was setting up in Vietnam and volunteered to go over and work in it. And she gets over there, and your story is that she discovers that this Canadian field hospital is effectively a front for the CIA to gather information on the Viet Cong and to plan their counterattacks. Am I getting that right? So that Canada was involved in subterfuge and, and subverting uh, the, uh, the North Vietnamese to that extent? That's right. Now, it was a hospital that was doing some good. It was treating patients with tuberculosis. It was also treating a number of people who had been, been injured in the war because there was the bombing raids going on in that territory. And what she discovered, though, because she was the hospital administrator, so she was keeping track of all of the records and all of the patient files, and she kept meticulous records. She, she was doing the same thing in Montreal when she, she left, so she knew what she was doing. But she discovered that the director of the hospital was taking those meticulous records that she was keeping, taking them to CIA agents. And she couldn't believe that that was what her records were being used for. She tried, she wrote a number of letters back to Paul Martin saying, don't you realize what's happening here? Don't you realize that we are treating people in this hospital that are being napalmed? They are, and the napalm is being built in Canada. So don't you see the hypocrisy that is happening here at the same time as we are helping the CIA? And she finally couldn't take it anymore, came home, and that's when she started her crusade that lasted right to the end of the war of trying to bring Canadians' attention to this hypocrisy. Professional rabble-rouser, really, though, wasn't she? Absolutely a professional rabble rouser, and she was an amazing woman. I, I, I spoke with her daughter on the phone, 
And her daughter looked at the chapter that I had written. And what she told me was, you've got her pretty well, but she was a little bit more angry than I think you're, you're letting on. And she, <laughs> she, she was not quite as polite with people as I think you're letting on. So I, I uh, took, took a little bit of the, of the blinkers off and said, okay, let, let's color her as she actually was because I've got permission of the daughter to do so. And yeah, she was very good at sticking the needle in, especially with um, political leaders. She confronted Pierre Trudeau twice, and uh, Trudeau was frustrated well, well, by wait. her twice. Confronted. He pulled by... He pulled up in his in his limo and rolled down the window to talk to her, didn't he? He did. When she was this doing a hundred one of her stunts where she was uh, she set up a camp. She wanted to set it up in Parliament Hill, but they wouldn't let her. So she was down in a, in a church, uh, a lot beside a church, just down from from Parliament Hill in the middle of winter. It was over New Year Christmas, New Year's, and she was there for days trying to bring again media attention to everything that was going on. She had met Trudeau once before, so Trudeau knew her and knew of what she was doing pulled up in his limousine and you can picture the scene It's freezing cold. The, the window rolls down and there's Pierre Trudeau who speaks with her and Pierre Trudeau basically said, no, we're not even involved in the Vietnam war. I don't know why you're protesting. And which was a lie that he must've known was a lie. He had to know that he was lying to her and that frustrated the hell out of her because she started to go at him about how dare you this and how much money are you getting from these defense contractors to the liberal party. It was at that point that the window rolled back up and the limousine uh, drove away. Yeah, he only let Eugene Whalen talk to him that way, I think. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe she should have worn a green hat. I'm not sure. <laughs> So one of the more surprising things, in 1979, I was 17 years old. Um, and uh, uh, six years ago, when the Syrian refugee issue was going on, I was comparing um, Canada's approach then with the approach taken to the boat people, the Vietnamese boat people in the late 1970s, mm -hmm. early 1980s. And I was bemoaning... What had become of our country, that a country that had once joyfully accepted 70,000 Vietnamese refugees was bitching about whether or not we should take 25,000 Syrian refugees into a much bigger population base. But you made the point that Canadians didn't want those 60,000 Vietnamese either. That the government, uh, and I want, I want you to at some point tell the Flora Madonna at the UN story in its entirety, because it's, I think, a very powerful story. But let's start with the fact that both the Clark and Trudeau governments took in refugees in the teeth of public opinion, not with the support of public opinion. Is that right? That's, that's absolutely right. What we had in 1970, beginning in 1975, when the, when the Vietnam War actually ended and the North came and took over, is it was absolute bedlam, not only in Vietnam, but in Laos and Cambodia as well. And it was a bedlam that resulted in thousands and thousands of Vietnamese people needing to leave to save their lives. They had to get out or, or, or their lives would be over. And I'm not mean would be made uncomfortable over. And so what was interesting is that the polls at the time, when a number of the first refugees came over in the first wave, they were mostly Vietnamese people who had some money. They had enough money to get out of there. But the second wave of Vietnam refugees that were coming in 1979, as you're talking about, these were the people that were, were not destitute, but they didn't have a whole lot of money. They were going to need support. As a result of that... Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. Can I stop you for a second? Please. I really didn't... I really didn't know this point, that almost all of that big wave of post-1979 refugees were ethnically Chinese almost all who were living in Vietnam. I didn't know that. Yeah, because there, there had been a, a small but a, a deadly little border skirmish between Vietnam and China and, and that, that ended. But the Vietnamese government then took that out on all the ethnic Chinese and the Trinh family that I'm that I highlight in the book was ethnic Chinese. That's why they had to get out. And so the polls at the time, the Clark government is in their nine month period right now. The polls at the time of the Canadians said, we do not want these people here. 
it was 58 to 68 percent, depending on the poll, um, were saying we do not want any more of them. We already think there's too many. A number of church groups were the groups that had helped with the with the draft dodgers that were coming up. A number of church organizations said we will help bring more refugees here. But even polls that were done in the churches said, yes, the church leaders want to help. But the laity, the people in the pews, vast majority said we don't want these people. So the reason is split in churches. And so Joe Clark and Flora McDonald, who was who was there as um, speaking at the UN, the group that was there trying to, to bring more countries together to help these people, knew that the vast majority of Canadians did not want these people here. If he had listened to the polls and did the popular thing, and he's got a really tenuous minority government, you'd think he would do what the polls said, but he did what was morally right. I'm starting to understand why he lost election so quickly. Yeah, well, yeah, because he kept doing the right thing. He was determined yes. to do unpopular things. <laughs> and the right thing. Imagine a politician saying, I'm going to do this because it's right. And he said, and Flora McDonald went to to the meeting that you're talking about and, and said that the Canadians would bring in about double, almost triple of what they were saying. And she said in that speech, I challenge all governments, all countries to bring in more refugees. And they did. The aggregate number went up. The Americans took more. The Brits took more. And over then they came because the situation, and, and as you research, the situation was set up so that the Canadian government would match what the Canadian people said. And so they would they would help and the help with education and with, with everything else. But the Canadian people were the ones that said, we will sponsor these refugees to come. And the Trin family was the family that I looked at, but thousands and thousands came. And when they came, they suffered greatly because of the discrimination, the racism that they were facing. And it was natural because the majority of the Canadian people didn't want them here. And that was the sad part. Yeah, I mean, I just want people to understand this. So this is an environment where... Um, People are as dead set against refugees as they often are. And the Trudeau government has a commitment, as I understand from your book, to bring 5,000 refugees to Canada. And Flora McDonald goes to the UN conference on refugees and she says, we're going to take 50,000. Instead of five. Refugees. That's right. And I, instead of five. And I ask every country here, to look at themselves and find it in their moral hearts to take in more people. And the number of refugees accepted effectively doubled, as I, as I recall. But Canada ended up still taking the largest uh, per capita percentage of anybody in the world. That's an impressive and compelling story about Joe Clark and Flora McDonald. And Ron Atkey is a big player in it, according to your book. Ron Atkey was, was there, right there, too. And he had read a book called None is Too Many, the Abella book, that talked about Canada not doing its bit to help German and European Jews in the Second World War. He took that book to his, to his staff, and he took that book to a cabinet meeting, and he said, this will not happen again. That was a powerful moment in Canadian history. Yeah, yeah. And then, in fairness to them, the Clark government loses, and Trudeau comes in, and Lloyd Axworthy becomes the minister. And uh, Lloyd Axworthy gets a briefing on the situation in which there's way more refugees and more demand from for sponsorships than has than has been met. And they raise the quota to sixty thousand. What was Canada's population in nineteen eighty? Thirty million. Forty five million or thirty million. It was it's in the high twenties. I think it was twenty eight million, which. Right. You mentioned per capita. That meant that we were we were already per capita taking more than any other country, and that increased it even more. And it is to Axworthy and Trudeau's credit that they said this is the right thing to do because they could read polls too. It's really interesting to read some of the stuff you have in there and to see the what in the current context would be considered to be blatantly racist things that newspapers and other authority figures felt very comfortable saying. And at the time, the very clear definition of Canada as a white Judeo-Christian country, mm -hmm. that these people were going to 
change by county. Yeah, that's right. It was it was the old Canada, the old Laurentian elite, if if we call it you know, the the Ottawa. English Montreal Toronto uh, corridor and everybody else is a region and everybody else is is simply to do as we said that was being challenged that was being challenged in the Vietnam War in so many different ways by by the young people by the draft dodgers by the people who were protesting against the government in a way that hadn't been ever been seen in Canadian history before and now by this wave of, of Asian refugees. It wasn't just that it was people coming in, it was that they were Asian people coming in. And all of these challenges hitting all at the same time led a number of historians with much bigger brains than me to say, this was the beginning of Canadian nationalism. That Canadian nationalism, not anti-Americanism, not pro-British, but Canadian nationalism and patriotism has its roots in the Vietnam War, because that is where so much that we had thought was certain was challenged and, and brought forward in a, in a new way. So we really did grow up as a result of what happened in the Vietnam War. Very interesting. It's a great set of stories, and it's a great overall contribution to the understanding of Canadian foreign policy and our relationship with the United States. I'm really glad I read it. So thank you for writing it. Don. Thank you and so here much. I truly again. appreciate that. <laughs> the Devil's Trick. How Canada fought the Vietnam War. And we didn't even scratch the surface of draft dodgers coming to Canada, of Canadians volunteering for the Vietnam War, uh, of the all the diplomacy that Canada tried to do. It's a rich, rich book and uh, fun and interesting to read as well. John, thank you very much for coming on. It's been Thank uh, you really so much. I sincerely enjoyed this chat. Yeah, me too. Take care. Go Habs, go. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to talk a bit about our place as Canadians in the big world out there. Not that we aren't big. We are. There's only one country that's bigger. I mean, everybody knows that. Our population, though, is smaller than California's. To, to use a colloquialism, Canada punches above its weight. But our sponsor, CN, bestrides the North American economy. Along with a very few other Canadian companies, CN is not just iconic in Canada. It's a serious competitor in the United States. CN trains roll through 16 U.S. states. In the 23 years since it extended its network into the Midwest and down to the Gulf of Mexico, CN's has stamped its famous logo onto the minds of American train spotters, motorists, and shippers. It has competed toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest railways on the continent, often leading the industry in innovation, efficiency, and safety. Its presence has enabled continental trade at the highest level. And now, CN is moving to extend deep into Mexico. Its proposed merger with Kansas City Southern, a longtime partner operating out of the American heartland, would make it the first North American railway to truly span the continent. A NAFTA railway. I've said it here before. It's a big deal. And don't forget what the C in CN stands for. It's a Canadian company and a corporate citizen of the world. All right, it's Tuesday morning. We're back to regularly scheduled programming here with Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed for the highfalutin intellectual firepower and erudite analysis of the week in politics. How are you folks? Great, how are you? So good. So good. Jenny. I can't even tell you. I, I'm going to tell you how good I am. All right. I'm going to tell you how good I am. <clears throat> My brother-in-law, Stephen, in his classes, sometimes does exercises. So Stephen bought an exercise mat. And the other night, Stephen brought out his exercise mat and was proceeding to show me his exercises. And he was doing uh, sit-ups. And I said to him, those aren't sit-ups. That's not the way you do a sit-up. Sit-ups are way harder than that. Here, let me show you how you do a sit-up. And I went yeah. and laid down on this mat, <laughs> and I could not pull myself up by my uh, abdomen once. Not one. I cannot do one sit-up. My <laughs> core has deteriorated to the point. If a neighbor hadn't I happened by, no we'd be doing the podcast from the mat. 
<laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. I, not only couldn't I do a setup, I can't get up off the floor without assistance. It. This 58 business is for the fucking birds. I'm telling you that. <laughs> wow. Well, Jenny, I see you got a haircut. I'm loving the bangs. Thanks. Woo! Sassy, short, bangy. <laughs> Me, I, uh, I think. Very summary. I, very summary. Very summary. I think, by the way, I should just say, as a public service announcement, I think we're nearing the end of this. I'm getting sick of the whole uh, looking like a guy whose ship sank. I think I'm getting close to the point where I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to gonna take a, some severe razor action to my face and head. I think going hairless soon. Really? So, so is that, wow. is, so, so where, is that anticipation for next week's pod? I don't know if exactly. I can pull it's the trigger by then. I'm thinking about it, you know, but I'm finding like I'm always going, oh, God, no, there's hair in my mouth. And I realize it's my hair that's attached to my face that's in my mouth. It's growing in, <laughs> it's growing over my mouth. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm filling in like a, like a, a disaster movie. It's just, you know, growing over me. There's an interim step, eh? There's an interim step called uh, trimming and grooming. Yeah, I just, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I had an interesting experience the other night. You know, you talk about failing to groom and just like, you know, society <laughs> breaking down to its, you know, constituent parts and people becoming more animalistic in their <laughs> conduct toward one another. I was, but I, I seriously had like a weird experience. I, I don't know, like this pandemic, man, it's, it's start. it gets at you sometimes, you know? And so I was out, I was picking up food and I was picking up takeout and I'm in a line and, uh, and there's three people in front of me. And then this guy bombs along, and he's one of these guys who's got his mask down under his nose, you know, which essentially makes me want to, like, just push him in front of a uh, streetcar. And, uh, you know, he, and he walks right past everybody in the line and goes into the restaurant where there's a little table set up at the front to stop people, and they take pick them. And he's in there, and he starts arguing with the guy. I want my I want. And the guy's like, no, there's a line. And then he's arguing at the guy who runs the place. No, I just want mine. I want mine. And so then there's, like, a couple other people, and people start – the guy in front of me tells him, hey, get back. Come on. There's a line. Like, get behind us. And so the guy's, like, really obnoxious about it. And he's, you know, he wanders back out reluctantly. And, and then he's, like, standing this far from me. And he's muttering. And I just turn to him and I go, could you back up? And he starts cursing. And then I start cursing. And the fucks are flying at each other. And I'm like, what makes you so goddamn much better than us? You don't have to wear your mask. You don't have to respect the line. You're just fucking stand next to me. Get, get shut the fuck up and get back. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm standing on the street yelling at this guy. He and I are yelling at the top of our lungs at one another. And I like just stop and I'm like, uh, and look at me, right? Like I look like, uh, you know, I live under a, a uh, an overpass and I'm like I I'm a crazy person now I've gone crazy I'm the kind of person who <laughs> is like I've gone full Karen right like I'm screaming at this guy and I'm thinking about like I'm so like I just I just like I just put my hand I just step back and I'm just like you know what man I'm cracking up I'm crack I'm crack I'm cracking up that's so so I'm thinking I gotta cut you the apologize hair. to him you apologize I, to him. No, piss on that. I didn't go that far. The guy, I st <laughs> still like to fill him in, but I, uh, I at least stopped yelling at the guy and looking like a lunatic. But I'm just saying, like, you know, you can start to feel, people are getting, people are getting weird. So, so I just had a guy on, I just had a guy on the show that I don't know about, but he wrote this book um, called The Devil's Trick, How Canada Fought the Vietnam War. And it's got all kinds of stories in here. I guess one thing I thought I would just mention to you, too, about this is that the Vietnamese boat people story is a little different than I remembered it. Because I remembered it through my local church where everybody was involved in bringing over boat people and there seemed to be a fair bit of enthusiasm. But he makes the case that the polling consistently showed that Canadians were seriously opposed to accepting refugees from Vietnam. And public opinion was decidedly against it. And the Trudeau government had a commitment to accept 5,000 refugees. And Joe Clark came into office and Flora MacDonald went to the United Nations and said, actually, Canada is going to take 50,000. 
refugees. And we challenge all you other countries to look inside yourselves and see what you can do. And so the global total of refugees was doubled as a result of Canada's intervention. Okay. <clears throat> to me, that story put the Clark's, Clark government's defeat over its budget in a slightly different context. They have been derided for stupidity. They've been derided for not understanding the political dynamic and walking into an election that they were going to lose. But this additional story makes the point that maybe, maybe they were an unusually principled government. Maybe they, Clark said he was going to govern as if he had a majority. And so then he went, goes out and he puts a tax on gasoline to deal with the deficit that was emerging as a problem at the time. And he commits to taking 50,000 out of a country of, what, 25 million people back in 1979? Commits to taking 50,000 refugees? Um, maybe it's time for a slight reassessment of that government. Sure. I, I think that's a great story. I don't remember, like, I, I don't remember in reading anything about... Uh, uh, anything about that time. Uh, I don't remember uh, hearing that story at all, but I think it's, you know, it's, it would be good to, to, you know, do a, do a reassessment because of, it won't take long. It was only nine months. It was only a nine month government. So, um, yeah. uh, but he, he is often that, that nine months is often overlooked simply because it basically was the, the, the very small inside sandwich or book between the, the Trudeau bookmarks. Yeah. Or book yeah. end, so to speak. I think it's yeah. all of a piece. Like I, I, I think that that, um, you know, people's strengths are their weaknesses. Their weaknesses are their strengths. I think that's Joe Clark. Right? I mean, Joe Clark, I think, carried himself with a sense that at times seemed officious and alienating. And by and large, I have lots of respect and admiration for Joe Clark. But I think he carried himself sometimes with this kind of like, I'm not going to lower myself. Uh, to the indignity of minor political matters. I'm just not going to do that. And that led him to lose a political challenge for his leadership because he wasn't necessarily willing to get into the trench and fight it out like that. It led him to declare that he would conduct himself as though he had a majority when he had a minority. Um, like there's a haughtiness to that. And there's even a haughtiness to saying, hey, everybody, we said five, we're going to do 50. Uh, you should be more like us. Um, and so in some manifestations, it's... It, it, it is principle, and obviously when we can apply it when he was in the Mulroney government to uh, standing up on South Africa. Um, but I, I think that's the nature of the guy, and I think that's why you can look at some of his time in office and say there's an enormous amount to admire there. There is principle there, and at other times you can say there's a tone-deaf haughtiness. There's an indifference to political consideration that you simply can't be inconsiderate to. I think it's all. I think it's all of a piece. The one other thing I would add, just on it's funny, David. I have the same memory. Just just on the specific question of the Vietnamese boat people, like in my high school. That it was a particular, um, uh, uh, a, a particular receive uh, receiving station, receiving uh, institution uh, in the county for kids. They all seemed to come to our high school, and there were two big locker rows at the end of a long lo uh, suite of lockers, and you know all those kids were there. Everybody got like a new anglicized, you know, uh, first name. So everybody was Charlie and Bob and you know Bob Quinn, you know, and. And those kids, like, I, you know, I don't remember resentment, at least not at, like, and you would think there'd be like that kind of, you know, small town nativist reactor. There wasn't. I, my recollection, at least, is we were falling over ourselves to be welcoming, to understanding how these people were like going through a real hardship. Um, a couple of the kids ended up being great athletes, so they got integrated and welcomed into the sports team. So I don't, I don't, and I guess maybe it's just rose colored glasses. Um, I, I remember it as, um, as a real act of community, um, community generosity and uh, and kind of pride that we were taking those people in. And um, I guess maybe that's something we should revisit. Well, there were 37,000 private sponsors. There were 37,000 private sponsors. So that element genuinely existed. But the general public was like, yeah, what do we want a bunch of Asian people in Canada for? And it, um, it's worth revisiting that because I'm so, sure that my review, I'm sure that my memories are distorted in comparison to reality. So let's get into a, a serious matter, and I actually want to approach it seriously because I know everybody is taking this deadly seriously. I learned that on the weekend when I posed a question 
uh, that actually mentioned the word vaccines in it, and I almost got ratioed for the first time <laughs> in my life on uh, <laughs> on Twitter. You should explain, um, you should explain, David, what ratioed means. I understand it to mean that I almost had more comments than I did likes to my uh, to my tweet, uh, <coughs> which means that it's not going over that well. Um, and but this business that came out yesterday with the NACI, and I'm going to admit that I don't even know how to fucking say that I think uh, without they say sounding Nachi. like Nachi, N Nachi, Nachi or Nasi, okay. Nachi, yeah. yeah. So, Scott, I want to start with you as a communications expert. Mm -hmm. And seriously, I mean, what is going on here? What ought Nachi to be doing? Are they a scientific advisory body that should be paying no attention to messaging and to vaccine hesitancy and just be pure truth tellers? Or ought they to be part of the government messaging machine? Or what is their role and what are they doing? So I, I think those are important questions because everyone's starting with the interview as opposed to taking a step back and saying, well, hey, how, how do these, how, how does this body fit into the architecture? Like, you know, if Health Canada um, makes it a regulatory approval of a vaccine, then what's, what's the role of this body? How does that role compare to Health Canada? How does it compare to... Um, uh, provincial health authorities, uh, health and public health officers. How does all that fit together? As best I understand it, they're an advisory body to the government that says, okay, Health Canada has gone through the exercise of saying the regulatory review has been done uh, based on our review, based on a review of clinical trials conducted elsewhere, based on other regulatory approvals. We say it's safe, it's not safe. And then that body exists to add, provide an added layer of uh, risk evaluation, uh, recommendations, and advice on how to implement uh, the use, uh, the rollout, all those sorts of things. But it is a vague thing. It's an advisory body. And, you know, and so then to put them out in front on communications matters, I think, you know, it, it introduces an immediate question of, well, is that wise? Like, are we, you know, is it, is it a good idea? We've seen, we've seen governments around the world since the beginning of this say, let's put lab coats out in front. That breeds credibility, that breeds comfort, that breeds confidence. Let's do that. That's good. Um, but there's also a risk to it. And we saw the risk, I think, uh, in these last handful of days, because I can tell you somebody that media trains people for a living. I do tons of media training. Um, you know, it can often be very, very difficult to media train professionals, um, doctors, lawyers, uh, scientists, researchers. And, and one of the reasons, and it's not like you get lots of, you know, Cracker Jacks. And when you do, you think, woohoo, I've hit a home run. And the reason you think you've hit a home run is that there is often a kind of underlying dismissal of communications as a, as a practice, as a discipline uh, you'll get from those folks. And, you know, there's kind of this sort of like, look, I'm not here to like spin or turn something in a bumper sticker. I'm not going to be involved in your sort of bullshit politics, communication spin. I'm interested in telling the truth. To which I always say to people that there's a hundred truths, right? Like you go over to somebody's house right, and have dinner, right, you can say, this is a beautiful home, or you can say, the roast sucks and your kids are ugly. So which truth is it you're going to um, choose to articulate? <laughs> and um, yesterday it appeared, or a couple of days ago, it appeared as though, uh, you know, the one, uh, the one researcher chose to basically go on television and say, let me put this in context for you. I think they're trying to kill my sister. I think that's what's going on here. <laughs> they're out to get her. So it's it's a lot more important than like your neighbor's uh, pot roast sucking, and she's not exactly. just she's not just some researcher. She's the chair of Nachi or Nachi or whatever we want to call. Nat I wasn't I wasn't trying to be dismissive, Jamie. I know I, agree. You, I, know, I know you weren't. I know you weren't. So here's the thing. I don't think that I don't. Can, or can we call it Nat? What do we want to say for this these purposes? Nachi. 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 Okay. It, it, so it, I can say that without getting close to Nazi, and that's my objective. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so for our purposes, everyone, we're calling it we're calling it Natchi. I have no idea why this advisory board uh, has uh, was out communicating, except exactly. except to question. say that except to say that and 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 you know except to say that uh, this is the product uh, of the government's decisions themselves because they were very happy to try Natchi out. Uh, over a month ago or close to a month ago uh, when they made the recommendations to extend the recommended uh, the recommended time between doses for Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca. 
And so and, and, and they were very clear in that report, I think it was April 7th, that that they were doing this because of lack of supply. And and it was and, and David, I think this is what you kind of got uh, almost ratioed on in the media. And I think it was a fair comment that you said it was that nobody in the media held them to account to say the advisory body. So this advisory body is basically giving the government cover because they had not been able to procure enough vaccines in the same amount of time, like in the amount, the recommended amount of time that Pfizer and Moderna had suggested that there be the, 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 um, uh, the doses. And the report was, if you read it, the media reported going, it's just, it's safe. Everyone just, it's, one is better than none, which I agree with. And I, I would take, like, take any vaccine. So I, like, I, that is not my, um, uh, but the report basically said, this isn't optimal. And you really have to look at people in high spread communities, especially essential workers in terms of kind of prioritization. So I think the problem the government has is that is that Nachi pr provided them cover on an issue a month ago. And so now yeah. they really don't have the they don't have the authority or the credibility to come out and say, uh, no, you have to shut the fuck up now. It's kind of the same problem Doug ran into in the fall when they had the press conference about turning all the different the colors. Remember the, 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 the like the greens, the reds, the yellows, the oranges. And that was something that seemed to be ham fisted. And David Williams came in and, and kind of cleaned it up. And since then, the, the doctors have had even more control over Ontario. And I think it's because they provided the politicians cover. And so I think that's part of the problem that um, uh, that's pro part of the problem the Trudeau government has. But her comments were absolutely like it, like they, they were absolutely nuts. It's one thing to say one vaccine is um, I, you know, preferable over another. Um, but over 1 million Canadians have now received, like I think 1.2 million Canadians the last time I checked have received AstraZeneca. And now they're sitting now like- <clears> Mr. There, deep vein thrombosis right here. Yeah. I've and, got the yeah. AstraZeneca, right? And so you've now, you, so all they have done is I think um, uh, caused more vaccine hesitancy among people that probably have been uh, have been nervous. And I think it's something the government has to, the government has to comment on. They were very quiet about it yesterday. Patty had you essentially almost repeated the same thing, uh, but it's very irresponsible for them. And, and, and if, if this is an issue between officials, then this is what Teresa Tam and the health health department have to, uh, um, uh, have to fix. I, I just Can I jump on that? Thing. Can I jump on that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. No, it, it I, I just wanted ahead. to say, like, I, I, I just want to extend that thought, which is I completely agree. When you're in government, and it's not illegitimate, it makes sense. When you're in government, you, you'll use uh, assets like an advisory body or um, scientists or experts of some sort. You'll use them, doctors. You'll use them to reinforce your credibility, to, as Jenny says, to provide you with cover. For sure you do. And then the question is, if you're going to put those people in the harness, once you've done it, you know that you've opened the door to that. That doesn't obligate you to use them constantly, but it means that you've decided that they are on the board as an asset to be deployed. And as a consequence, they can also be asked and invited by media into that. So if you're going to do that, then you have to work with those people. And you have to make damn certain that they're disciplined and that they get it. Because yesterday she was doing risk communication. And, 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 and risk communication is all about creating a sense of confidence, context, and proportion. When you say, but is that what she? Wait a second. Oh, was it? Was is that, that what she? Is point? that wait? Is that what she thought her job was? So let me ask you. It is her this, job. It has to be her as, job, or she as, can't be on there. Okay, but what okay, was she responding? As, but what was she responding to? What was what risk was she responding to? Because she's caused it. Like there was like the the conversation that people. No, she's talking about. She's talking about risk communications and that there's an inherently a risk with but, but you know. What was she respond like? If, but if you're if you're doing risk communications, you're responding to a risk. There was the government wasn't at risk. The risk has remained to be uh, that, this government, in that, my that, opinion. Yeah. I don't mean political risk. I mean that she was in the in the business in that conversation. I'm talking about Wait what are the relative risks of taking one vaccine versus another. That's risk communication, and you. You have to be extraordinarily disciplined. You have to rehearse. You have to know what your messages are. You have to know what your go-tos are when it comes to examples you're going to use, stats you're going to quote, analogies you're going to employ. And she wasn't. She was too loose. The story about the sister, I joked about it, but it's a grievous example of how to communicate the risk in its proper dimension because it suggests like, oh, and then she might fucking die. Well, so whoa, okay, so that's what's so going to cause was, So wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Her, say, she's I mean, terrible. Can I just say one thing? Like, but what she said was this, sorry, David, we keep cutting you off. You're like, oh, <laughs> but let me go. No, but, but what would she, but A, Scott, I, I get she was doing risk communication, but nobody was really talking about, uh, people were talking about 
uh, the different length of time between doses. That was what the conversation was about in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of Nachi. So she went out and actually opened up a different flank, a different yeah, risk that's right. uh, to the government. So she caused a risk. She, they tried to send her in to do cleanup, to do media for a decision she made less than a month ago. And she ended up cleaning up. But what was almost worse is the actual mindset, because to me, it's not, it's not all that scientific. Like she essentially said, um, if it was me or my family, I wouldn't take AstraZeneca. Uh, and if you happen to live in a giant house or in a rural area where there's no COVID, you wait and you don't take it. But you poor bastards that that uh, are essential workers and uh, you have no choice but to leave your house and uh, and you have no choice but to work from outside your house. You take the risk. But all my all my rich friends and and family, we're not going to take the risk. And and I think that was completely, completely irresponsible. And this government has to actually like. Dis- like they're they're, they're, they're going to have to they're going to have to clean it up. Wait. But it is it is. Let all me ask you this question. Let me ask yeah. you this question because you're all assuming that she wanted to be an effective communicator. Maybe she's a science advisor. So throughout this whole thing, I've been hearing a lot about people demanding transparency of the advice that the government has been getting from health officials. Much of it at the provincial level. Let's hear what the health tables are saying. Let's hear what the health tables are saying. And there's this frustration that politicians have been mediating health advice to the public. Well, is it possible that the government gets a lot of different advice from the health tables? Is it possible that the experts don't all agree? And that if you let the experts start talking, you find they don't all agree. And then you've got a disastrous communications exercise. Of course, but that's that's what we were saying about like it's this is so. So if you remember a, a year ago, we talked about the different political the styles of politicians in Canada. You had the Kennys and the Horgans that were more head, and you had the Trudeaus and the um, uh, you had the Trudeaus and the and the Dugs that were more heart. The heart politicians, the Trudeaus, the Doug, they made more political theater of it. Um, and I and I'm not like I I'm just I'm stating a fact. It was more it was more political. How they re- responded was more political. They were they advantaged whether they tried to or not. And I'm not saying they 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 did. That's a conversation for a different day. They were two politicians that advan- that 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 adv- like had advantage because of of pandemic. So did Oregon, Kenny, obviously not. But if you look at how they handled it, you have the cast of Ben Hur out uh, in in Ottawa communicating. We're talking about that now. Tam Nachi um, in in. Ottawa or in, in Toronto, on some days you would have David and Dr. Dr. Williams out and sometimes they'd try the chief, chief coroner, out, which would always surprised me and made me very feeling uneasy when they would, would bring him out. But then they, they would do another presser with the help with the people from the science table that could completely contradict what Doug and and Williams was saying. Whereas if you look at like how Horgan with Bonnie Henry and Kenny with D- Dina Henshaw, Henshaw and uh, Henry are the only two um, medical community. They're the only two medical communicators. So I think these health tables, the same as politicians, um, sh- should have been like putting their people together. It's like politicians getting advice. It's like politicians bringing their cabinet together. They have to be presented all the facts and then make the decisions based on those facts, David. So I, I agree with you. They, they obviously don't agree, but this is this is the consequence of 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 the style that Trudeau and Trudeau. Uh, decided a year ago and and it's now coming back to bite those politicians in the ass more so than um in other jurisdictions yeah i i agree with that it's a matter of discipline like i i I, like it is the discipline of communications and so i'm glad these health tables exist i'm glad these advisory bodies exist i would assume that they don't all agree and that they have arguments about it and i'm not even necessarily looking for them then say okay well we've all decided to sing from the same song sheet and like all that but if you're going to just be crass about it. Like, I'm just being really crass. Like, if as a government, I used to be a director of communications to a prime minister. If we're going to say that part of our part part of our strategy in managing this is to provide people with the reassurance that experts are also guiding and, in, and influencing decision making, and here they are, and this is what they have to say, then you have to work with those people to ensure that they are capable of pulling that off and to talk about risk in a way that is disciplined and and shows respect for the discipline of communications. I think the problem is, you know, occasionally, and everyone screws up from time to time, Christ knows I've blasted myself to the moon talking into microphones from time to time, but to my mind, yesterday, that or this example um, is, I just do not believe that there could have been sufficient consideration as to whether or not this person uh, was uh, approaching it seriously enough 
whether this person was prepared well enough and whether there was a clarity on what we're trying to achieve, what we're not trying to achieve. And, and I, that's why you end up uh, with an ineffective analogy that blows up in your face and distorts any sense of proportion around the risk. Well, or or it could it, we 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 ass, we're we are assuming that 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 Trudeau uh, that the government uh, had a hand in this. It could be a possibility that this table um, uh, wanting to clarify decisions they're making, probably not fully comfortable with the government messaging around the the uh, the you know three week dose versus four month because it it ter- like all of the caveats that that were in that report from April 7th were not communicated by the government for obvious reasons. It might be a position where it's one of those that like you have an independent body calling the minister's office and then they, they, they call, you know, the director of communications and health calls someone like you, Scott, and says, we have no fucking control. We can't stop this. That's it. Hey, listen, you're into the sausage making. That happens. Like, um, like that's, that's, but that's a I failure thought. of protocol establishment from way back in the process, right? Like, I mean, you have to establish what the rules of the game are. Are these advisory bodies free agents when it comes to speaking on, out but, publicly or not? But, and but that, goes, but that goes back to my point. I think they, they shouldn't be. I think there should have been protocols put in place, but all protocols have been thrown out the window. Uh, is when you're going to use health officials for uh, uh, cover in terms of political decisions that you've made. But we, sorry, the only small asterisk, we don't know. We don't know if they have a protocol. We don't know if she was put in the harness deliberately and then just executed very badly or whether she uh, didn't feel that she had to adhere to a protocol and she just did this on her own, in which case it's a miracle there haven't been others, seven other examples like it. Well, I really appreciated it because she essentially told me that I was a rube uh, right. for listening to the advice that I got, and I was a fool to go get the AstraZeneca vaccine. I've put myself at risk. The other ridiculous thing about her intervention is the judgment call that she asked people to make about the relative risks between them. People have no capacity to assess that risk, zero, zero capacity to adequately assess that risk. It is irresponsible to put that in the hands of ordinary people to assess that for themselves. Well, um, it is. The- yeah, and that's the scary part. Like, if you look, like, like the the vast majority of people in the UK, including their prime minister, have been vaccinated with AstraZeneca. I think it's, I, I think that it's. I, I agree with you. It's completely, uh, it's completely irresponsible. And even thro- the throwaway comments of, well, t- talk to your family physician. How many Canadians don't have a family like that? Don't have a family doctor. Sure. I don't have a, d- a dedicated family doctor. I haven't since I I moved to uh, I moved to Toronto. So like it, mm. it's it's it's. I think there are there are literally millions of Canadians without a family doctor that just don't have the ability to call up and say. Hey, what do you think? Should I should I hold? Am I am I able to hold off and wait for like Pfizer or Moderna, or should I, you know, uh, go in and get AstraZeneca? Just mm, failure all around. All around. Speaking of failures all around. Speaking of failures all around. Exactly one year from today. Exactly one year from today, we all get to vote against the Ford government. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> Pardon? I think the Ritz, the Ritz dropped, isn't it? It's June third or something. Oh, is it? Is it the okay? It's June one 2nd. year to the start. June second, yeah. It's it's like oh, the first shit. Thursday right. or something. But we'll be All into right. the, so, we'll be into the thick of it. We'll be talking about it. We'll be campaigning about it. Um, Jenny, is he going to get reelected? I think it's tough. I, I've said I've said from the get go. I think that it's going to be hard for a lot of incumbents to uh, uh, to get reelected, and I think that probably the last three weeks of the Ford. Uh, um, of the Ford government have probably been the worst that they've had since um, uh, since being uh, elected. It just seems like a uh, a thorough um, st- like just incompetence. And I think that we're seeing even and we're seeing the the ability of the federal libs to kind of start to weigh in. We saw the uh, uh, the, the Wilkinson uh, yesterday announced that uh, uh, the federal government was going to take over the environmental assessment program for a uh, uh, process for Highway Four Four One Three. And so I think those are just interesting. Uh, I think those are interesting dynamics. I think that nothing is going to change in terms of the building of the highway, but I think it it, it continues to show a a level of uh, chaos. This this premier can't even you know um, uh, this premier can't even build a highway. So I think uh, you liberals have are all going to band together and uh, regardless of the stripes, uh, uh, take on uh, uh, take on Doug uh, and uh, and his team. But I think it's going to be if if. Uh, um, if, if, if the next kind of 13 months is the same as the last kind of month, I think it's going to be very, um, 
I think it's going to be very, I, tr I think it's going to be very tricky. I think that Doug is going to realize his cozying up to Freeland and Trudeau uh, is not going to be reciprocated uh, in the next uh, few months uh, leading into whenever the next, the federal election is going to be. Scott, is he going to get reelected? Um, I, you know, it's really hard to say at this point. You're asking the question at the, at the absolute, um, crater I'm asking, of his... I'm asking you to step up and make a prediction. Come on. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, um, <laughs> I, if he continues to be the premier, if they don't replace him, I think that he'll probably lose the election. Um, and and I, I think that that has a lot to do, obviously, with the last two months. But I think it may have a lot to do with the next two months. I, I think they're about to make a tactical mistake. Um, you know, Jenny just talked about you know, he's going to have to switch from being best pals with the feds to um, to being their uh, their opponents and, and casting them as the opponents. That's clearly the strategy. They're going to have to uh, they're going to have to do that. And they're about to launch advertising against uh, the feds. That tells me two things. One is they are deep, deep, deep in an approval rating uh, hole and they know it and they figure they've got to change the channel and they have they can't rely on earn media to do that because earn media is overwhelmed with covid and their own performance and so they can't get that out so they're going to use paid and social media they're going to try to purchase a message and power it through to people on borders and try to uh, blame the feds and get something else going there i think though that that could end up backfiring a bit in that i think in the current environment the cognitive dissonance dissonance of saying i'm gonna i'm not gonna use um, this pandemic as a political instrument to fight and, you know, which, and I think now you're going to see that they're going to be forced to, um, that with their advertising, I'll bet you a dollar that Ford is not going to be able to maintain that message discipline while he's at microphones day after day after day. And he'll bail on it at some day, times and some days and undermine the paid media message. And I think a lot of people might take away from it uh, a discomfort and go, well, wait a minute. I thought that we were, I thought we were all one team until we get through this thing. And so they're going to have to navigate all those things. And I'm not sure they're going to do a very good job of it. And the populist Doug doesn't like to tell anybody no to their face and point and, and be unpleasant. He likes to say, yes, yes, of course, I'm just doing my best and working hard and getting along with everybody. Nobody loves that person more than me. And he's going to have to pick some champion. messages. Champion. Pardon me? You're a champion. Yeah. So I, I, I think they're going to have a hard time with this play. I understand why they're doing it, but I, I think they've got a guy in Ford who is manifestly uh, wrong uh, when it comes to the, his capacity to, to execute that, that pivot. And I think they're gonna, it's going to get very clunky, and I think they're going to be very defensive. So we'll see. But, you know, the question all becomes sort of like, does, does, do the votes consolidate around the liberal opposition? You know, does Horvath get off the mat? If she doesn't, then, you know, you maybe you, things get better, people feel better, the votes start to split. Um, but, you know, they ought to lose. They they should lose, all things being equal right now. Well, and, and just to, to keep with the theme, I'm actually going to agree with Scott on almost everything that, uh, uh, everything that, uh, everything. We're that just like Doug and uh, Christia. <laughs> <laughs> just Virtual like Virtual hugs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I agree. Except, I think except you guys don't. You guys don't do fake fake hugs and air kisses. You guys are really friends. <laughs> uh, we can. We can. Um, so I agree. I think. Listen. I think the messaging on the border. Uh, I, I think I said this last week. The messaging on the border would have been very good, circa March, April of 2020. Yeah. I think that it's a bit late to the game. I think that if Doug had been consistent on the border over the last year, um, he would have more credibility now, which is why I think the ads are gonna seem very crass to people. Um, uh, it is going to be using the pandemic uh, for uh, political reasons. And I think that people are very concerned about it. Um, I think they're concerned about vaccines. Again, I think that's the failure of opposition politicians of all stripes and premiers regarding the, the feds. I think that, you know, not to sidebar, but they should have been on the feds in the fall when it looked like, you know, the the we were not the supply like the procurement we were not going to get the supply around the same time that others were going to because we had put all our eggs in the Kinsano basket but that's not about um that's not about Doug so I'm not sure I think that it, you know if 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 I was if I was there you're trying to find issues that uh as you lead into the campaign uh, that are not fully defensive and I I agree with Scott that I think the 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 
the focus on the border and the focus solely on the border, on the feds, I, I think eventually the questions get asked, okay, so Doug, what exactly are you talking about? So, so you were talking about um, I, you know, non-essential travel. So out of the people that are exempt, who exactly are you talking about? Because then it gets back down to like, you have to then answer. So is it, is it you know, people that come in for funerals? Is it elite athletes? Is it um, family members? Is it spouses? Is it, is it children? And, and I'm not saying that they should, that the federal government maybe shouldn't close the border uh, or, or shouldn't have before. I think that that ship has probably sailed. But I think that the, I think that, that what this got, look, what Doug's going to have to realize in his people is it's not going to be one of those, Scott, to your point of just being able to go out and give a clip and, you know, gosh darn it, we're all in this together and we got to close the borders and I've been calling on it. Okay, what does that mean? What are you, when you meet with Trudeau, you guys have had 30 some first minister's meetings, you have umpteen calls with him directly or with Freeland or with Dominic LeBlanc. What exactly are you proposing? What do you propose? Do you, do you propose a full shutdown of, of the border? Because that's just not feasible either. So what are your exemptions? And I think that if they continue down this road, I think the, the, the feds are very skilled in maneuvering, uh, man, maneuvering around Doug. And I think that's going to be where they end up, where they end up going. So I, I have a conclusion and a question. My conclusion is building off something Scott said that they are in a lot of trouble, perhaps even in more trouble than the public polls indicate. If a year out from the campaign, they're spending money on advertising and advertising negative about COVID management, because that is a high risk strategy that you would only employ if you really felt you couldn't let your situation deteriorate any further. Well, considering so man the management, considering the management of COVID, like, Considering they're not like the opposition party in Ontario, they've they've been front and center. Like Doug's Doug's yeah. been front and center in COVID management. So to put COVID management to your point on the table yeah. is a very risky proposition right. generally. One thousand percent. Very risky that conclusion. That was completely the way I read it too, David. Like you got it. They're doing right. this because they have to. The question I have is, you know, our old friend Richard Mahoney who was one of the co-chairs of the uh, 1995 provincial liberal yeah. campaign yeah, I in Ontario, <clears throat> said that the liberals were winning that campaign until people realized that the liberal leader wasn't Jean Chrétien, but was in fact Lynn McLeod. And the fact that the Ford government is going after the feds with their advertising campaign, does that mean that when they look at the polls, that show the liberals tied or ahead of them, that they think that's really Trudeau and not Del Duca. I don't think they should. I don't think there's any. What I don't think there's any evidence that Trudeau's taken a, a hit in the polls. He's you know he's a he's a six he's he's in six years of incumbency and his disapprovals are still are still lower. Like they're in the fifties. The one of the last public polls I said, but his disapprovals and yeah. David polling is your your bailiwick. But like he's he's still at a less disapproval rate than. Um, than Aaron, I think that if I think I think it, it would be a mistake if basically at this point in the in the cycle, based on um, the polls that they decide to campaign solely against uh, uh, Trudeau, because I think they're I, I think, you know, it's they're, they're essentially to me, I'm looking at Trudeau starting like I saw that that 413 announcement yesterday. They're starting to pivot to campaign against Doug because I actually think he's a the bigger lightning rod. He is he is the he, they need someone because Aaron Aaron is just not well known. He's not the people that know him don't like him, and he's and he's not the lightning rod. So if they they need a boogeyman, so to speak, to campaign against, and I think you're seeing Trudeau pivot towards Doug. So I'm not sure what benefit it, it would be for the Tories to pivot then towards uh, towards Trudeau. It seems to be more like falling and eating into like eating into to the Liberals' hands. Yeah, I I think. I think your point about the feds seeing Doug, I mean, the feds have an election presumably coming up faster than, than the province. So that I think they may see Doug as a, uh, as a, as a, as an opportunity. Um, but to your point, David, the way I, I read it a little different. I don't think that this, like these, this advertising, um, campaign that's supposedly coming, I don't think that that tells you that they've made the decision that their permanent opponent for the next year is Trudeau. I think it tells you, maybe it does, but I think I, I think uh, a more modest analysis suggests that it, it just, it tells you that they've at least concluded um, that a precondition to success um, uh, is 
is to make certain that uh, dissatisfaction with COVID is is a uh, a widely held uh, problem, and that they that they can't be the sole owners of dissatisfaction with COVID management. They've got to spread some of that onto the doorstep of the Fed. So I think they're trying to take COVID management not off the table, but as off the table as they can by saying, you know, you may not like what you've seen here, but you have not fully appreciated how much blame should go there and hoping that that just kind of makes the whole thing a year from now, a pox on everyone's houses. And so then they can turn and, and, and focus on other issues. So I think they see it as a precondition that right now they are they are holding that bag almost entirely in their own hands and they need to they need to share some of the grief. But I don't think that's a pretty risky that's a pretty risky thing to do. I, I agree. To, to, the, to, to David's point, we're a year uh, uh, in a year from now we're going to be sitting uh, in a writ, if not very close days away from uh, from a writ and Right now, like now you should actually be on like your your narrative. It, it could be negative, but borders are not going to be seemingly probably an issue this time. So you're, you're essentially, depending on how big the spend is, um, uh, you're really taking a risk uh, in terms of wasting messaging. Like it's it's right. it, like at, at this point in the cycle, um, you know, you know, maybe here or there you, you throw out some missives and, and you make sure it, you know, you, you put it online and you, you know, put it on all the news networks and because it's it's. You know, you don't have to spend a lot of money and, and it's more of a shot across the bow and you want to get some earned media. But like to do an actual buy on an issue that that is not fully a winner for you and is is, is literally just a defensive, but not like a very good defensive uh, and that probably isn't going to be an issue in a year. Seems like a very, very risky strategy um, uh, to me. 100% agree. And we're not even counting in the dynamic aspect of it, which is it's hard to overcome a paid media message, but it can be done. And we may be in a circumstance where that's easier rather than harder. I mean, the feds may be able to come back with both barrels and say, while we've got the entire media focused on COVID, why don't we ask you some pointed questions? Do you exactly picking up what you're saying, Jenny, about what would you do differently? What precisely is your approach on the border? Is this just bullshit politics? Because it sounds like bullshit politics. Everybody, when you see these ads, think bullshit politics. And, you know, they may find themselves uh, encountering a backlash. And so it doesn't, it, it's a high risk proposition. The other thing, by the way, is in my experience, I've, I've done a lot of pre-read advertising and some of it's been effective and some of it's not been effective. And I can say that people are so disinterested in Ontario politics at the best of times, much less a year away from an election, that if you want to have an impact on people a year away from an election, your creative better be great and your message better be killer, like important, because you could easily spend two million bucks and have nobody even notice it happened. Yep. Yeah. Um, so... Um, what's more ridiculous than the fact that the Green Party is divided? You know, as Robbie Robertson said in the last waltz, there aren't enough people there to get angry at each other. Like, how <laughs> the fuck do you have such a <laughs> a small, uh, you know, rump of a group that can't even get along with each other and is sabotaging their own efforts? What a weird story this is. Well, the person that seems to be sa sabotaging the effort solely has been Elizabeth May. And it seems to be a hist like this seems to be a um, it, it, it's almost like uh, a party that's, uh, you know, uh, it, it like it's built on this cult of this one woman. And if she can't be leader, um, damn it, no one else will be. It's 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 like her own uh, a friend of mine on Twitter. said it's like her own vanity project. Uh uh, he said over the weekend. So I find it strange. I, I wasn't like, let's not forget when Elizabeth May became leader, didn't she push out the faction? Was it David Chernyshenko? Um, He was based, he ran in Ottawa center. He was yeah. deputy leader, leader. Yeah. She kind of pushed his, uh, his, his, him and his people out, became leader. And now she's seemingly undermining um, uh, enemy, uh, uh, enemy uh, Paul. And so, um, you know, and, and if you're looking at the polling, uh, and based on the fact where Paul has said she's going to run in Toronto Centre again, which we've talked about already, and, and I, like I, I think that's a huge, huge mistake uh, for her, we could be in a scenario this time next year where Elizabeth May uh, is the last woman standing, so to speak, for the Greens after an election campaign and, and back being leader by uh, de facto leader. And the party's letting well, her do that. I, I like Elizabeth. 
And I like her husband, John Kidder, whom I've met through her and, and seems like a nice fellow. But I will say, Scott, that when, when we took over the Liberal Party in 2003, I'm just damn glad Aileen Kretschow wasn't the president. That might have been a slight impediment um, <laughs> to, uh, <coughs> to our pulling things together. You know, like, what is the guy doing hanging around? Charles trying to be a force yeah, in the it's, party. I don't really know what the internal dynamics are, uh, obviously. That certainly suggests that there's this, you know, the old guard doesn't want to let, let go. And, you know, they've got they've got effective control of the apparatus of the party, which is the only thing that exists, really. It's not like you have a big caucus or other, um, yeah. other uh, pieces of infrastructure to work with. And so... You, you get this. I, I think there's been a big mistake made, though, um, because, you know, the politics are so vicious because the stakes are so small, as they say, you know, the old line about academia. And um, people don't know much about the Green Party right now. They don't know enemy Paul. They don't know how interesting and appealing she is. And we do know because we got exposed to her on the podcast here and you did that interview and you got to came away and go, wow, this woman has got a lot of game and she's interesting and she's different. Um, and so instead of doing everything they can to focus on that, her own team, it seems to me, Paul's own team, has decided that the only issue that anybody's – nobody in the world's paying attention to it, but the degree to which there's any political um, coverage, focus, concentration whatsoever on the Green Party, it isn't about how enemy Paul is a breath of fresh air and something interesting to watch. It's about the intramural politics. Someone on her team went, uh, went has gone out and has, on the record and then off the record, raised these issues, and people are never interested in intramural politics. It also, at some point, un uncomfortably, introduces an issue of um, uh, failed management. I mean, this narrative, when it persists, is, well, can't you get your own house in order? And so, you know, to me, st instead of talking about it, you know, if it's that big a problem, then you just got to go Michael Corleone on people, right? You just kind of lock everybody up into a room and it's like bang, 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 bang. And when you leave, there's some cleaning up to do, but you're clearly in charge. And, you know, when uh, people don't have any room uh, to ask the question of who is enemy, Paul, because right now we're wondering, well, is there an internal struggle? Is it old guard versus new guard? Is it about diversity versus... Uh, uh, you know, 1960s uh, counterculture types who are overwhelmingly white and uh, more affluent. It's like, what's what's the deal here? And they just don't have, they, they, they don't have the luxury of having this pissing match in public. They should just end it in private. And I mean, end it. Like, she should just go in there and be ruthless. Samurai well, sword time. Well, but I think that speaks to kind of, uh, uh, you know, she is a neophyte. She, she's not, like Elizabeth May has cut her teeth both in NGO, non, like, She's been in politics for decades uh, or in the political sphere of, of things, whereas Annemi Paul has not. And we've seen, uh, to your point, Scott, Annemi Paul is different. She, she has actually tried to bring the Greens into the debates on vaccines. She spoke very, um, uh, you know, uh, she spoke a lot on the Uyghur issue when it was, when, when it was being debated in, uh, in Parliament, or she wasn't in Parliament, but she was, she was speaking about it. And, and Elizabeth May, as long as, as, as the, the, uh, the Green Party stays a one, a sole one issue candidate, they're not going, your party, they're not going to do better than what they are. And Paul actually has a vision. She just has it. She, she doesn't have the cut and thrust. And I agree with you. One of the first things when Stephen Harper was elected uh, leader of the Canadian Alliance back in 2003, um, uh, our, our national council, our executive council, um, had people uh, that were obviously supportive of uh, of stop that caused problems uh, at the uh, at at the start and uh, those national councillors it was a uh, seemingly it it seemed more vicious at the time to my very young uh, uh, to to a very young uh, Jenny Byrne being involved in politics it seemed very vicious at the time but he basically uh, those people were were pushed out like essentially you know, bullet to the brain. And uh, that sent a signal to the party. Hey, I'm in charge. Uh, this is my, this is, this is my party. And it might be a bit too late, unfortunately, for her to be able to, uh, for her to do that. There's been too much time and they're too close to an election. So this is another gift for Trudeau having a very dysfunctional uh, Green Party going into the, uh, uh, going into the election. Sometimes doing politics and sing in the NDP. is the and same sing as- in the NDP. Cause she, she, she looked to me like she yeah. could really be impressive when she was on the pod and it all seems to be frittering away. 
Uh, and you pushed her on these questions, not with reference to this circumstance. You weren't aware of it at the time, but you pushed her on this point about, you know, the professionalization of the movement and whether she was going to have to cross those bridges. And, um, you know, my, my, the point I was going to make is that sometimes doing politics differently means doing politics badly. And um, that's what's happening right now. So very quickly, very quickly, 10 years ago this past week was a federal election um, uh, that uh, resulted in Stephen Harper's majority government. Uh, we don't have a new Democrat on this panel, so that event cannot be celebrated in its full glory and fashion. Um, but maybe... The orange wave. <laughs> maybe... Maybe each of us has a memory or an anecdote about that election that uh, we'd like to share. Well, oh, Jenny, have, we got to start with you. Well, I have a lot. I don't even know where to. I don't even know where to start. There were so many. Um, I, uh, there were so many uh, uh, very good memories of that uh, 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 of that campaign, and I've seen a lot of my former colleagues uh, 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 online talking about. Uh, uh, talking about theirs, there's listen. There's there's some fun stories that we could we could get uh, into that I I remember it and it's and it's mostly there's there's not big arch overarching ones where you know we sat one day and we all sat back and said we've got our majority like it's I think it's it's it, as you guys know it's very less West Wing uh, than it is uh, uh, that than people think that it is the campaigns are not there's usually they're defined internally anyways by smaller events as opposed to. Um, uh, as opposed to larger events. And we had some, um, we had some, we had some, like we had, I, I think I almost remember the bad ones more than the, the good ones. There was the issue about, you know, uh, Sun News breaking a, what was seemingly a picture of Michael Ignatiev uh, spending Christmas in Kuwait in like full military fatigues that turned out not to be Michael Ignatiev. Um, that was at the end of the campaign. Uh, and in, in the end, end of the campaign when you want there to be no problems. Um, of course, Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, uh, I was um, I was killed uh, on the eve of uh, uh, on the eve of the election. Um, but yeah, I don't have I, I feel bad. I should I should have thought of I don't have a specific story. There's just so many. Um, uh, there's so many. But it was a you know, winning campaigns are fun campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. I, have, I wasn't uh, involved in this one. Either were you, Scott. No. But we watched it. We watched it. And, you know, I um, – so two things that I recall that jump out at me. One was um, uh, the most overwhelming recollection I have is of election night. And I remember I was on television for CTV covering the election. And when the when coverage had ended, I actually went to your place, David. And I remember just sitting there having a drink with you. And I think people forget this. Um you know, but I remember you and I were sitting there thinking to ourselves, well, you know, th there's n there's nothing inevitable about the Liberal Party of Canada. There's nothing inevitable about its continuation and its existence. And Liberal Party and and Britain fell apart and disappeared when, you know, when it didn't seem like there was any reason, any longer a reason for a centrist party. When a centrist party, a, Brent, a centrist brokerage party gets weak, it can really get squeezed right off the map. And that was the anxiety was, oh my God, we've got the conditions now for the NDP to say, um, you know what, we're, we're, we're owning this part of the spectrum. There's really no place and no need for the Liberal Party of Canada. And and its future was in grave doubt. So I remember sitting there that night. I don't think I've ever gotten so many messages in the middle of the night from media who were literally like lots of DMs with people going, so like, is it curtains for the Liberal Party? Could it be curtains? And I remember sitting there with you and I sitting there drinking. And our conclusion was not that, oh, it's for sure not curtains. It, it could be curtains. The other th memory I have of the campaign, clear memory, and it angered me, was the decision when things were really in the last couple of weeks, when it was obvious that the rails are coming off the Liberal campaign, and that the decision to throw the, the ball the big down Easter the field, offensive you're talking about, yes, the big Easter offensive, rise right. up, yeah, rise up. That's right. So you take these goddamn town halls, the town halls that he's doing. I mean, this is I, I, you know, people. People sometimes criticize me to say I'm so unkind to Ignatieff, but I just thought he was such a self indulgent 
uh, candidate and leader and, and figure. He was just so self-indulgent. And, and the idea that you would s conclude that if people could just see you in the way that you are in those town halls, so take the thing that has not worked throughout the campaign and say, we will spend what money we have left on buying a half hour of primetime television to to, to slam people over the head with the thing that they've not responded to. I'll give you a bigger dose of the carrots that you're leaving alone on your plate. It just <laughs> made me insane. It was such an irresponsible decision. And I, I just can remember like when they did that half hour infomercial showing them the rise up, you know, town hall. It's like, no, that's what you think you're good at. No one else does. If they did, you'd be ahead in the polls. You're behind in the polls. Find something that people like and respond to. Don't quit. Like, just, it was so self-indulgent. It was like a 30 minutes of masturbatory exercise that led to the near death of the party. It just angered the shit out of me and still does to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the thing that sticks with me, it didn't actually happen during the writ. It happened shortly after the writ. And I was taken out to lunch by one of the most senior NDP organizers in the country who basically sat me down and said, listen, you're a realistic person. You're a mature observer of politics. Liberal Party's over. It's dying, if not dead. And it's all about us now. So you should come join us and you can monetize your current status because the Liberal Party still is something. You monetize your current status by joining us now, or you can decide not to, and we'll just destroy you riding by riding, province by province across the country until you have nothing left. So these are your choices. You can join us or we'll kill you. And I spurred me on to about seven years of serious political activism with the Liberal Party because I was so never been more offended by... Uh, by any message that anybody's delivered to me over lunch than I was by by that. They'd be highly motivated. That was certainly their attitude coming out of uh, coming out of 2011. We should, at some point, perhaps have a, a new Democrat on to talk about 2011 because it's the high point of their of their movement, and uh, <laughs> they uh, they consider it a big achievement. And we should probably talk about it from that perspective sometime, but. Well, I, I, like that do, do we here. do we think that uh, so so they've got one remaining seat left in uh, in Quebec, uh, Bouleris, uh, and do we think I guess we can after the next election if we'll see if he still remains the uh, the last man standing or whether the uh, uh, I think it would be the probably the bloc uh, that would take uh, that would take that final seat um, uh, from from them. It would be the 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 official end of the orange wave. Yeah. All right, guys, it's time for Hey Yous. It's time for our Hey Yous. Who wants to start? Who's keener? To, who's a keener today? Uh, on you, a hey go, you. You, go, you go first. Okay. Um, I'm probably going to steal yours, David. I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is where your head is at because you've been so consistent and uh, focused on this issue. But my Hey You goes to Marilee Fullerton, and I would just wish that she would just go away. Um, I mean, I thought that the response first to the AG's report and then to the long-term commission – I mean, they set up a commission that didn't have full authority and powers. It still was uh, damning in its um, in its conclusions. And, you know, the minister's press conference, it doesn't get much notice because, you know, it's a provincial matter and she's not the premier. But it was an absolute disgrace. Uh, there was no acknowledgement of failure. There was no apology. There were no measures uh, articulated or a sense that there is a plan that's necessary. There's certainly no reflection on, did we have a long-term care structure in this province um, with the mix of private and public that made sense prior to the pandemic, much less off. There's nothing, no answers, no reflection, no acknowledgement of fault. Um, it felt to me like it was half bad politics and half bad lawyering uh, that said, be careful about uh, making sure that, you know, you don't say anything that might open up uh, liability issues. I just thought it was a disgrace. And we know because of ATIPS that she has articulated different views on this matter. And I just think, you know, at some point you just have to say, I, I, I'm going to tell, um, I'm going to tell it like it is. And that did not happen when they released this report. And I, if you're going to be that ineffective, if you're going to be that weak on some of the matters this much, then just, just go away. Get out of public life. 
And if she doesn't take your advice, my hey you goes out to everybody in politics who doesn't really know what they're going to be doing in the next provincial election. Let's all meet up in Canada Carleton and defeat Marilee Fullerton. Everybody who wants to, let's all have a meet up in Canada Carleton and take this woman out of politics. She's absolutely in in a in a year in which a no, number of politicians have not covered themselves in glory. She's an absolute poster child for neglect and disinterest on the most tragic of files. So I agree with you. She should be out of politics. And if she doesn't do it on her own, let's do it at the ballot box next election. Jenny, what's your hey you? Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to our first topic. My hey you is to uh, is to Justin Trudeau and uh, the Canadian government. Uh, let's see them out later today. Hopefully, by the time people listen to the pod, uh, in terms of uh, uh, giving some clarification to Canadians uh, in terms of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, thirty four percent of Canadians have uh, have received their first dose. Only three percent of Canadians. Uh, um, have have received both their three to four percent of Canadians have received their uh, their last dose, and we know there are there is some vaccine hesitancy, and and uh, you know people uh, people have been shamed for that hesitancy. I'm very pro vax, so I, like I, again, I shout out everybody, go get your vaccine. Um, but I think that it is it is in, very important for the government uh, and health officials to clarify exactly what she meant because not we've we've seen vaccine hesitancy with. Um, I, as I said, across the country, including we see reports of, uh, of uh, you know, some essential workers that work in congregate living facilities and long-term care facilities and retirement homes uh, that, that have a hesitancy as well. And I think that this is just going to add to people that have had, um, that, that have had concerns about having the vaccine. And so I think it's extremely, extremely important uh, that the government, uh, the Canadian government clarify that. So that is why I'm, I am, I am not wasting, but I am using my hey you to just reiterate what we talked about earlier on the pod. Not a waste at all. Thank you very much. I just want to leave this with one thought. Let me just say one thing to you before we go. Cole Caulfield. Yes, I was hoping you brought oh, this up. Oh, baby. Cole Caulfield. Over time. Oh, thank God. Now, if they if you take that team and add a sniper to it, maybe we got something. So what Maybe I love we was, got something. So I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. He called me and I realized halfway through the conversation, not even halfway, it was to kind of gloat about the Leafs. Oh, and you know, they're you guys are gonna be playing us, and there is no getting, you know, Matthews is gonna fuck you guys. Like, but I was reminded, I was reminded. I, every once in a while I need a reminder. And across my social media feed, it started with my cousin Jacob, who's a huge uh, Leafs fan. And of course, yesterday was the uh, what was it, the 20 uh, eighth anniversary of the, is that that long ago? 28, 48, 1967. No, 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 no. no, 28th anniversary of Doug Gilmore's overtime oh. goal. Second the, in the, in the, in the playoffs against St. Louis in, it was his, it, he overtime in the, in, in double overtime. And, you know, everyone was tweet. Oh, the killer. This is great. This reminds me of how good the Leafs are. And then it, I, I, you're reminded they fucking lost in the, those playoffs. <laughs> Everybody thought they were going to win. So it reminded me not to, like, like, you know, not that I want to like throw that in Toronto Maple Leafs face, but they were going oh. to 90, 93 was going to be their year. And we know whose year it was. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I love that Caulfield kid. He, you can just tell the, both those overtime winners, not only did they occur in a team where people just, didn't finish the job. He finished the job both nights. But when that puck is on his stick, he's a pure goal scorer. You could just tell from the second, fifth game, fourth game, fifth game last night, and you're just like, this kid, he's a pure goal scorer. And God bless him because it's the one thing that's been missing for 25 years from the Habs. <laughs> the last Montreal Canadian to finish in the top 10 in scoring in the National Hockey League was Matt Nasland in 1986. Oh, wow. Really? God, I was gonna. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say Danfoos. Jesus, that's, that's exactly. Really I was gonna say Danfoos. Yeah. Danfoos was top twenty, but not top ten. Last top ten was Matt Snazlin, nineteen eighty-six. Wow. Team of Grinders. Well, wow. all right. Hey, great to see you. Thank you so much for your time this week. Thank all of our listeners and viewers. Thank Telus. Thank CN. Thank Metal Donkers Good and Andy, our video technician, the whole Air Quotes Media team, and of course Scott and Jenny, as well as John Boyko great book pick it up read it and uh we'll see everybody next week thanks for listening bye bye guys bye